Welcome, welcome. You are listening to Think 100%, the coolest show on climate change. I am Rev Yearwood, President and CEO of the Hip Hop Caucus. And I'm Mustafa Santiago Ali, Senior Vice President of the Hip Hop Caucus. Welcome to our radio show and podcast that delivers real talk on climate change and environmental justice. No sides, just the facts and stronger communities. First and foremost, I want to thank um, all of our family here at WPFW um, and definitely some of our partners out there like the League of Conservation Voters and the Union of Concerned Scientists and so many more in the movement. Yeah, and you can check out our show uh, and our blog at think100.info. Let me say that again for folks because you don't want to miss it, think100.info. And be sure also to follow us online at think100show and also hashtag think100. Send in your questions, your comments uh, to that. We will be monitoring that to make sure that we're getting that to our guests and also helping to guide us with our show. And uh, Rev, take it from there. Yes, indeed. Well, Mustafa, we have a special guest in the studio, y'all, for, for those who know, I have a, an array of hats today. I try to get a, a, a connection. I have a, the, a Brooklyn Dodgers hat. So that's, uh, you know, it's kind of like, you know, a little bit from the, from the East Coast to the best coast, as they would say. Uh, uh, and today we have an amazing leader, uh, joining us here in the studio, Congresswoman Nanette Berrigan. She represents California's 44th district, which is in South Central LA. She has an amazing background as a leader at the local level, including fighting fossil fuel development, hurting her community. Now she's in the United States Congress, taking bold action to address environmental injustices and act on climate change. For example, last year she started the United, the United for Climate and Environmental Justice Congressional Task Force, Along with our other good friends like Representative McKeachin, who's on our first show. Um, and so with that, Congressman, welcome to Think 100%, the coolest show on climate change. Well, thank you for having me. And that's a beautiful hat you have. <laughs> <laughs> well, no doubt, no doubt. Congresswoman, we want to, again, thank you so much for being here. We also want to congratulate you. Yes, on, indeed. Uh, on getting a 97, 97 on the League of Conservation Voters uh, new Community First report. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the League of Conservation Voters uh, actually pulls together each year and sort of analyzes those members of Congress and the work that they're doing uh, in relation to climate and environmental justice and other environmental issues and actually holding people accountable by putting a spotlight on their voting record. And so you got an A. So we're very, very proud to have you here with us. Well, thank you. Next year, we'll make sure it's at 100 percent. There it is. I missed a vote and didn't know as a freshman member that you're supposed to put a statement into the record to say how you would have voted. So now, now I know. There it is. There it is. Rev. Well, well, Congressman, you know, you have an amazing background, including working in the Clinton White House. Um, at the NWCP. Actually, I was a Clinton White House intern for those who... Really? When? Man, I was... I, I, I'm going to date myself now. <laughs> you know what I mean? Go ahead and tell the truth. Tell the truth. No, 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 no. But I was, was there in 98. Well, I was not I was in the first term. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I was an intern, so I, I was there uh, uh, in that capacity. Actually, it's a funny story with that. We had to get into at some point in time with, with that process um, at the White House. But you've also been working with the NWCP as a local mayor, and for people who don't know you, um, particularly around those who might not, who might not be on um, on the East Coast, fill them in on your background a little bit. So I'm the youngest of eleven kids. Wow. Um, my parents, yeah, I was the last accident. My, <laughs> my dad was 59 years old when I was born, uh -huh. so you know I was the last accident. Um, and they were my parents were immigrants from Mexico, and so mm. my mom had a third grade education. I grew up in the Carson Harbor Gateway area, not too far from Compton and Watts, where I represent now. And, uh, you know, my mom always said to aim high. And she said, doctor or lawyer, that's the only way you're going to get out of poverty. And I see blood and I want to pass out. So I went to law school. There it is. And so it's always been about fighting for injustices and fighting so that we have justice 
and equality. Just want to say that my, my mama, who I always mention on this show on The Frequent, she is also one of 11 as well. Oh, nice. Yes, indeed. I don't think she was the last one, though. She was like, <laughs> I think, number three or four there. So she comes from those big families and, and like you, came way where she's from uh, Trinidad. Came to this country the same way. My, my parents came here, and so it's amazing to us those who parents who came here, but then also like you know love this country and want to do so much work, right? For make it make it make it better. Yeah, uh, Congresswoman, um, you know you are a huge champion for environmental justice. You know I, I love watching your work. I love seeing your commitment in this space, um, and you're just taking Capitol Hill by storm. Um, coming from Los Angeles and the communities that you represent, can you share with our listeners sort of what got you engaged around environmental justice issues? Was it something that you saw, something you experienced? Sort of just take them down that road. Well, my district is one of the most heavily polluted districts in the country. It's surrounded by three freeways and the port. And actually, when I was a kid, my father had a home right next to the freeway. And as a kid, I thought... This is a great place to have a home because you can conveniently get on and off the freeway mm -hmm. and you would get places faster. But of course, over time, I started to learn about air pollution and the truck traffic and diesel and how it really impacts air pollution. And then I understood why I had allergies and why mm. people in my family had asthma. Mm -hmm. And so I started to make the connection and for me, once I started to make that connection, said, we need to do something about this. Mm -hmm. So uh, when I was in college, I got involved. Um, I used to work for... And what, and what college did you go to? I went to UCLA undergrad. Okay, yeah. okay. And then USC for law, the best of both worlds. Okay, so. all right, all right. <laughs> so I, um, I, got, I was working with a nonprofit, uh, and so I was uh, convincing our um, president to help fund... Um, organizations that were fighting against climate change or fighting to clean up the environment. And that's when I first got started um, on the environmental issues. And then when I ran for city council, we had an oil company that was trying to drill into the California coastline. Mm -hmm. And I said, this is crazy. Now, people told me then, you don't know which way the wind is blowing. Why would you take a position on this issue before you know it's politically a good idea? And that's when I said, that is what is wrong with politics. That's right. We have to stand up for what's right. Mm -hmm. And this was wrong. And so I, I took a position early, and uh, the voters rewarded me. And I came and, first. And for folks who don't know California, and a shout out for those who are listening from California, tell them, because they may think, hold on, uh, oil, offshore, and California. And so explain to them how actually – the fossil fuel with the oil rigs that are out mm -hmm. there. You can see them in people's backyards. Kind of give them a little background of how much the fossil fuel industry is in California. Well, it's actually pretty huge, and a lot of people don't realize this, as you mentioned. So in my congressional district, there are a ton of oil drilling um, facilities and refineries. Hmm. And so you could literally go to Wilmington where kids um, have inhalers, where doctors' offices pile them up because they are waiting for the kids to come to get inhalers. It is so sad. Mm. And you can walk around in Wilmington and you can see a playground and right next door the oil drilling facility. Or you can go to people's backyards. No, 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 no. You don't mean like next door. You don't mean like you don't mean like next. You mean like like about ten miles away. No, like right next door. As a matter of fact, we introduced a bill that said there should be at least fifteen hundred feet between an oil drilling well and a residential home. Mm -hmm. Now, where did I get 1,500 feet? I looked at Dallas, Texas, and I said, well, they know just a little bit about drilling in Dallas, mm -hmm. and that's a regulation they have, and I thought it would be easy to get to middle ground with people on both sides of the aisle and saying, hey, this is an oil capital. That's what they use. Why don't we use these in our, in our neighborhoods? There shouldn't be urban oil drilling, and we can't even get that moved. So it's insane when you see it. When I was fighting oil drilling um, off the California coastline, they were actually going to drill within 500, 600 feet of where I lived. And then it was going to be slant drilling out into the ocean, into the Santa Monica Bay. Mm -hmm. And that's when I said, absolutely not. I'm going to stand up and I'm going to fight. And we did. And the voters overwhelmingly said, not here, not now. And now what do we have? A president who wants to open up the California coastline. Yeah, I often I often wonder um, if most folks or our president knows that 25 million people in our country have asthma, 7 million kids 
have asthma. Um, and I know you've been huge in, in helping to fight and some of the issues you're talking about now. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, how that plays out in African-American and Latino communities and, and, and the work that you're doing? Mm -hmm. Well, you're seeing, I think, uh, this activity of the fossil fuel industry targets communities of color mm -hmm. because they're lower income. They're less likely to be able to come and mobilize and speak out. And so it's happening right in my backyard, in our community. I represent a district that is about 86% African-American and Latino combined. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's no surprise, I think, to see that there is a real fight there um, and that people tell me when I knock on doors, they say, well, that's why we elected you, mm -hmm. for you to be the voice. And I say, well, we need to have our communities mobilize. And so it has been a very uh, disheartening to see uh, people say, well, there's not enough political outcry. But what, what we have to do and what I love about your show is making sure we're educating people about the harms and tying the health impacts that their children and their families are facing. Uh, because if I go talk about climate change in Compton and Watts, I don't get the same response as though if I say, this is connected to being a public health crisis. Mm -hmm. Your child's asthma, the increase in cancer rates, that's happening because of air pollution, and then explain what climate change is. And sometimes that's a little challenging to do, but everybody cares about the health of their children, and that's when they really pay attention. Mm -hmm. And I know folks miss, first of all, for those who are just tuning in, welcome to Think 100%, the coolest show on climate change, we have here in the studio Congresswoman Barragan. And if you just heard, she's straight out of Compton. Straight out. Come on now. Come on straight now. Out of, Compton. <laughs> out of Compton and Watts. You know, so she's like the real G now. You know, so when she's going on, you know, she's one of the fighters on our side. When she says she's taking on uh, offshore drilling and taking on those oil rigs next to school uh, yards, you know that she's going to take it on. There's, there's no fear there when you come out of Compton and, and Watts. It's, so, first well, thank you for for that. And in that spirit, you know, we have these young people mm -hmm. who clearly young people are saying, listen, we have to transition. Matter of fact, today is the one month anniversary when, you know, you know, hundreds of thousands of young people came into D.C. for the March for Our Lives right. when they came here on March 24th. And, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a shame because, as I've said before, when you have. In the 20th century, you have folks who are fighting for equality, mm -hmm. but now you have young folks fighting for existence. How do we build and carry that young people's energy forward? Well, first of all, we have to listen to young people. And for too long, uh, people in politics have said, well, they don't vote mm -hmm. and they don't listen <laughs> to them. And so our young people are starting a movement. And as we see and have seen in history, it's been young people who start movements who change the world and who change our lives and so we have to pay attention to them and we really have to make sure they do get out and vote so that their voices are amplified and there are so many issues whether it's gun violence um, in Compton today um, there is brown water coming out of the faucets hmm. brown water we're holding a town hall on this next week on May 2nd because and the news even came in and they showed they ran the and, water and where for those warm. folks we got folks in, in Compton, Compton Tell them, tell them where. We've got folks listening, I know, in Compton right now. So on May 2nd, it'll be on our website as well, George Washington School. Um, it'll be in the evening, and we'll post it. Um, it should be up already. And so we are trying to bring a community together to give them a venue to come and be heard. Mm -hmm. And then we're trying to bring in panelists who are going to hopefully help answer some questions and see what we can do because it is unacceptable when there's brown water coming out. And they're told, oh, that's safe to drink. Who's going to drink brown water? Mm -hmm. And then give it to your kids. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then to see it on television with the news vans come out and report on this, there's got to be action. There has to be action. And what I hear that really frustrates me is, well, not enough people are, are, are having an outcry about it. And I said, that's not how this works. Everybody should be entitled to clean air and clean water. So we're hoping... Uh, to shed some light on this and see if we can get some movement on this. Um, tomorrow, Keith Ellison is introducing a bill called the Water Act that's designed to exactly address things like this. We'll put uh, about $35 billion a year, I think, into water infrastructure. And uh, we just cannot take the excuse anymore 
that it's the pipes. Because you know what? In Beverly Hills and in Malibu, they won't allow that to happen. Come Why on, are we going to let that happen in Compton and Watts? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It sounds very, very familiar. Um, the same thing started in Flint, Michigan as well. You know, a mother and others noticing the water quality and saying, wait a minute, something's not right here. This doesn't look right, doesn't taste right. Um, so I'm so glad that you guys are, are focusing on that. Um, you know, as I travel around the country, I often talk about the Climate Justice Environmental Justice Task Force um, that you helped start. Um, can you share with folks a little bit about that and how that plays into sort of the strategy and addressing these issues in our communities? So my colleagues who helped start this with me were all freshmen mm-hmm. and we're all people of color. And we were talking about how communities of color are disproportionately impacted by climate and pollution and so we decided to start this task force to shed light on some of these issues and uh, we recently have been talking about possibly doing field hearings going around the country to these communities so that they could have a voice to shed light on this and what we really need is we need people engaged and mobilized a lot of people don't know what to do they don't know who to call um, or frankly they're working two jobs they're living below the poverty line and they can't so we would love to go out and mobilize people, even if it's a letter-writing campaign, calling people um, to making sure that they're aware of what is going on in the environment and how it impacts them so they can be the messengers as well. Mm-hmm. And so my colleagues and I have come together to introduce bills. Hopefully we can get these field hearings done. But this is just the start of the conversation. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Well, I just wanted to send that, you know, because when you are from Compton, and Watts, and that's your district. Shout out to the 44th. Uh, Thank you. West Coast capital of hip hop and rap, right? Well, I do. Well, 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 when I knew I was going to, I, you know, I, you, you are on the coolest show on climate change. Um, and so we want to give a shout out to one of your, one of your residents there. You know, the amazing Kendrick Lamar, who actually won a Pulitzer Prize mm-hmm. for. Um, and then also Kamasi. I don't know if you know mm-hmm. the amazing Kamasi, who actually has a song called Trouble in the Water with Common on our People's Common Music, right. which deals with Flint. And so how do we utilize culture? Because you mentioned something like we're having these town halls. We have we have a serious condition where people have brown water mm-hmm. coming out of their faucets. Literally got to decide if I'm going to get my child this water, make some tea. and this It ain't tea. Right. <laughs> it's brown water. And we have the situation where folks with this administration who want to continue to push for fossil fuels, how can we use culture? How how can those your amazing artists who come out of Compton, like a Kamasi or like a, a, a Ken Lamar and like so many other artists, um, those in, in the West Coast from Rage and those old school right. and that aspect, how do we use culture from your perspective to create change? Well, I certainly think it would be a great way to engage our young people if we have – Um, people like Kendrick Lamar who are willing to maybe write songs about some of this, uh, maybe host um, a concert, maybe just come out and do an appearance at one of these events where people want to, they have somebody they can relate to, right? When you listen to his songs, Mm -hmm. um, there's one in particular called Fear. It talks about fear that communities of color face Mm -hmm. when they go out, right? And so people relate to that in different spheres and in in different ways. different ways and so i think it's super super important that uh, we get them involved and engaged in the conversation to bring in young people to bring in different people who otherwise might not be the activists um, who are out there on the front lines on the environment well we just want to thank you so much for being here you are incredibly dope i am so blessed that you are (laughs) on capitol hill fighting along with so many others for our communities and that you actually really care. Um, and for those who are listening, you know, sometimes we have uh, the folks who we see, um, but they're not connected to our communities. This is a congressperson uh, who is so connected to our communities and, and, and walks the walk uh, just like the talk the talk. So we really, really appreciate you. Thank you, and come out to visit me in Compton and Watts sometime. Most definitely. And with you, we want to thank you, Congresswoman. And with that note, we want to give you someone from your, from your area to, to lead you as you go. 